So, okay. Uh, so, what we're going to do now in this next session is we're going to talk a little bit about how to use MISP and, and how to interact with the interface and so on. Mm -hmm. So, until now, we've talked a lot of theory, but we've actually not seen MISP so far. But before we get there, there's still one part we have to chew our way through, which is a basic description of the data model. So the idea behind this is just to explain what kind of data you're going to be dealing with, what kind of uh, what the various fields do, just a very quick overview. So as Alexander has already mentioned, the most important thing what you're sharing the, or the, the thing that is common to everything that you share is the event. So the event itself is, is a container with the metadata. Uh, here's just some of the fields that you can share with an event. Uh, one of the most important things uh, that, that you have to do whenever you're creating an event is describing what, uh, what the data that is going to be contained within actually is meant to achieve. Uh, keep in mind that uh, you might start out small with your own internal MISP only for internal purposes, but you might join a, a larger community later down the line. Something that we've seen, and this is something that is causing a lot of confusion at times, is people, for example, putting internal ticket numbers as a description of an event. So that is great for your internal housekeeping, not so great whenever you're sharing with the community later on. So if someone gets a ticket number, not very relevant. So be concise, but put something in there that makes sense for the community. Okay. Uh, something that is common to all the, uh, the elements that we're going to be dealing with here is that they have a distribution level. So both events, attributes and objects are the three main uh, um, uh, objects that we're, that we're exchanging uh, have that. Basically these decide who can see the information and where the information will flow from your MISP out. So th these two things are slightly uh, different in a sense that uh, one of the things that you have to decide is the flow of information, the other is during those flow, who can see it on the various nodes that the MISP reaches. So these are all controlled via the distribution level. We're going to see how that works more uh, during the day. Uh, another thing is that all information created in MISP has an owner. So that means that any event that, uh, that, that you see out there has a creator organization behind it. These are uniquely identified across different MISP instances, so that means that if you're seven hops away from the circle instance, you will still get uh, data in through those different hops if they're interconnected, uh, coming from circle marked as circle data. Uh, generally in MISP, you are not allowed to modify any data created by someone else, but you may propose changes to it. Uh, so this is also something that we're going to talk a little bit about on later on. But the important thing to keep in mind is events of a creator organization that define who is the one that is responsible for the event, we can edit it. Then each of these events is, uh, is made up of a list of attributes. So again, these are those atomic, uh, atomic points of data that could, for example, describe an IP address. It could be uh, a malware sample. It could be something like a car plate number, if you're in one of those communities. Uh, so basically the data is described in a, uh, in a tuple of uh, four fields uh, generally. One of them is the value, so that's the atomic value itself, for example, the IP address. Uh, the category describes uh, why this is relevant, in what context this IP address was seen. For example, it is a network activity, it was used in payload delivery and so on. And then you have the type which basically tells uh, the user or other systems uh, that this IP address is in fact an IP destination, it's an IP source, it's an MD5 hash, and so on. Sometimes this can be a little bit confusing. For example, if you're thinking about hashes, hashes can have various different uh, uh, use, uses despite having the same format. So for example, uh, uh, a file hash will be very different from uh, a certificate uh, hash and so on. And you can already describe some of this context via the type. We don't always separate them out, uh, but in cases where, where uh, the usage would be very conflicting in a sense that you expect very different tools to take care of the data, we separate them into separate types. Like IP source and IP destinations. Yep. So you can describe an IP as a source or mm -hmm. either as a destination. Yep. Uh, apart from that, uh, there is also a contextual comment for each of the attributes. Keep in mind that uh, even though you might only be feeding the data at first to feed your IDS and your SIEM or whatever tools you have internally, uh, you're also probably going to share with humans out there that are reading the data. So whatever context you have, it might not help you in, with your IDS use case, but it might help an analyst sitting somewhere that is tracking a threat actor. So whatever information you have that you cannot describe in a, a structured way, just put it in there. And that's quite important in MISP. You, basically, the information that you populate in MISP can be either human-consumed or machine-consumed. 
And that's something that you have to keep in mind sometimes. Some producers of data are only producing data for machines or sometimes only for humans. Uh, but in this, we support both. Uh, so sometimes it might be challenging for uh, some analysts to analyze some data because they are lacking contextual information. Mm -hmm. Then each time an attribute is created, MIS will check whether that attribute exists already in the system. So this is what we call a correlation. It's either a direct match of something that's already existing or another uh, attribute that, um, that uh, through the correlation engine is deemed to be close enough to be a match. An example would be, for example, uh, fuzzy hashing. If you have another uh, file sample with, uh, that you also have the SSD value of, then, you, uh, then depending on the thresholds you've set up in your system, uh, MIS might flag it as a correlation if there's a high enough overlap. Uh, same thing with, for example, CIDR blocks. If you have uh, an IP address and an IP range, and the address is within the range, it will create a correlation in that case as well. Okay. Uh, additionally, this is something that Alexander has already touched on uh, on before. Uh, with this whole collaborative aspect, one of the things that we tried to do was uh, being able to circumvent this whole uh, ownership question of, of events. So even if you don't own an event, you should be able to add something to it and say, okay, I have additional information. I would like to share this back to the community. And this is where this proposal system comes in. So if you, if you look at the graph itself, it looks very similar to an actual attribute. And the reason for that is that it's basically a blueprint for an attribute to be created or for an existing attribute to be, to be modified. So you can either attach a proposal to an event saying, I want this event to have some additional information that I have found, for example, in my network, through my feeds that I'm subscribing and so on. Or you can say, I, I see that you've published this information. Some of it is incorrect, could be further enhanced. And here are the proposals to modify those existing attributes. Uh, one of the most typical use cases for this is basically just saying, OK, this is a false positive. Just get rid of the IDS flag on this one. I don't want uh, you to basically pollute everyone's networks with this. Or for example, you have a report from an antivirus vendors contain a list of IP addresses and one is mistyped uh, from the report. And then people propose a change yeah. to this uh, typographic error. It, it could be something like that, or it could be something that, uh, that your automatic process has basically picked up as a, uh, as a mistake. One of the most typical use cases is you're just uh, uh, encoding uh, PDF reports that you get from vendors quickly, and you accidentally put the vendor's uh, URL in there as well, which was somewhere in the report referencing their own site. So if you have that in there, that's of course not an indicator, even though it was indeed in the report. Uh, so that's a false positive in that case. So stuff like that happens. Yes? Does the original um, creator of the event need yeah. to do any additional steps to make yes. sure? So yes. to be able to do that, you need to make sure that you get the data back in your own mix. Exactly. exactly. So, so if you only see there are lots of people are only doing a read only of you. Yeah. Then, then they will never yeah. get it back indeed. Okay. So, you, you, so yeah. it's a very good point. So you really need to, to be within a community where you can reach out to the creator organizations indeed. Yeah, and for example, indeed, if, 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 you're, if one, one of the links in the chain got the information through a feed, for example, which is read-only, uh, then there is no way to, to convey that message all the way back to the original creator. Then it cannot be acted upon. So other people don't still see the proposal? Uh, yes, 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 yes okay. everyone sees a proposal, yes, yes, yes. Exactly, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, the, thing the problem with that is that proposals by default will not go to your tools. So the, the exports completely ignore proposals because very often you will have proposals in there that are conflicting, for example. The, on the only exception that yeah. we make is unsetting the IDS flag because sometimes it's basically almost an emergency to basically remove the IDS flag from something if it's a false positive. So what we do is you have a system uh, setting in MISP and you can say any proposal that you get an attribute that says unset the IDS flag, I want to adhere to those and just not push it to my devices. So you can use that as an override, uh, but you cannot use, uh, uh, use proposals as an override in the sense that if it corrects a value, if it adds an additional pr attribute, those will not go to your tools. Uh, another way to to convey this information to other parties without having the appro approval of the, yep. uh, of the vendors or the creators is to basically create an extension. So if you have an extended event, you basically have your own event that gets carried on over the different MISP, and this one, it will be linked to that event. So, so uh, yeah, one of the things that we've seen very often is you get a report in, and you do your own analysis in addition, but you cannot modify the existing report. You could create a proposal, wait for someone to accept it. That might never happen. So what we decided to do is you can create your own event and say, 
latch this one on, onto the original event and use this in an extend event. So that means that if you go to the original event, you have a button now that says, just show me the full thing with all the extensions, and it merges the list of, of attributes into one list. So you can do that. Of course, the downside with that is if you see an existing attribute that you want to override, it won't do that for you. So you cannot say, this one is wrong. I use an extend event to remove it. So that's, then you have to use the proposals. Yeah. Okay. So, yes? Yes, what you could do is you could create one event and, and just say that this one uh, uh, is, uh, is extended by all those events. So you, you, could, you could do it that way. Uh, the only, uh, only downside, of course, is that whenever you, are, you want to export that to other tools, they will be exported as separate events. However, there is a flag that you can set in the API, say, just give me everything in extended format, and then you're going to get the full thing merged. So, yeah. Of course, uh, this might lead to some conflicting information, for example, in them, but that's, of course, a given but it's, it's a good point, because you can either use it for, for example, you have a report from a third party that you want to modify, but indeed, if you have different tools and you want to combine them, it, it works too. Um, uh, but it's still different JSON files, but they are still all reference to the different different one so uh, yeah but well, we can do a demo of the extended event yeah sure okay uh, some other things that are interesting here and this is still uh, uh, what MISP was like very very long time ago was we figured out that okay we, we we would like for users to be able to add more than just technical information in there so besides the comments there was no way to really contextualize the data so what we came up with was a very simple system that was basically simple string tags so that means that you could label any event that you had and say, okay, this is related to this or that or that, or put any markings on it, for example. Uh, and one of the things that we initially noticed that this was an utter disaster. Uh, we expected people to, for example, put TLP tags on, on events. And what, what we found was that human creativity has no bounds. You can write TLP green in at least seven different ways with a, a dash, with a double point, spaces, and so on. So we figured, okay, this is not something that we can live with for a very long time. So we came up with this whole taxonomy system, which is basically a blueprint system for different tags. That means that if you want to describe TLP, we have a TLP taxonomy, and you can just take the, the label from that taxonomy and use that. We still allow for free text tag, uh, tags uh, in addition to the ones coming from taxonomies. Uh, we, we see some use cases, for example, if you have an internal tool and you just want to tag something to be fed to a different tool and use as a filter, by all means, create a tag and use it. Mm -hmm. But for anything that exists in a... Uh, yeah, nowadays, if you look at yeah. on one of our communities, 80% of the tags are coming from the taxonomy. Yeah. So it, we see that people are commonly switched over from using free tagging at basically selecting yeah. the tag from the taxonomy. The free tag tags are really becoming the edge case. One of the things that we also encourage users to do is, if you cannot describe what you want to do via the taxonomy set, we have proposed your own. Either use it then internally and distribute it out of bound with your partners, or share it back to us to the larger community. When you're going to look, uh, take a look at the taxonomies that we have, you're going to see that we have some very specific ones for certain communities in there, because we want them to be able to distribute it via the standard channels to their users. That doesn't mean that anyone else outside of them will use it. If you're an administrator of MIST, you're going to see how you can uh, basically drive the um, contextualization process within your community by enabling and disabling certain taxonomies. So we're going to see that in, uh, during the administration part. <coughs> then this is the more up-to-date version of what um, our um, data model looks like. Ex uh, besides taxonomies, we've gotten a whole new system called galaxies, uh, which allow you to, uh, to basically also contextualize data like you would with tags and taxonomies, <coughs> but to also provide metadata along with it. So for example, before what people were doing is, uh, if they wanted to describe something that was related to APT29, they put the APT29 label on it, which was fine, but if, you, if your partner receives that and has no idea what APT29 is, then they're in a bit of, uh, of, of trouble there. So what we try to do with uh, uh, Galaxy is, we, is we having a massive standard library of things that you can describe. So we have a massive threat actor library with synonyms, uh, suspected country of origin, references to articles about them and reports about them, and so on. And then, then instead of just assigning the label, you're assigning this full object that exists out there. You can, of course, create your own, so it's, a, it's they're basically JSON blobs that you create, but then you need to share it out of bound with partners. 
we, we have often a questions, um, when should we use tags and when should we use yeah. uh, galaxies? It's very easy. If you can uh, express it in a tag, use a galaxy. That's basically it. So tags are basically simple key values. And if you can express it as a simple key value, go for galaxies. And then you can express meta information and stuff like that. Um, so it's, you have a lot of examples, uh, but extending it is very easy. You can just create your own files and just add more information. Mm -hmm. And, and some of these galaxies are coming from local communities, for example, uh, that are that are asking for certain things to, uh, that they uh, that they can express. But sometimes we're just translating existing libraries out there. So this is where, for example, attack might be interesting. We highly encourage you that if you're describing TTPs to use attack because uh, everyone is moving in that direction. It just makes sense to use something standardized. It's also a very cleverly designed yep. framework. So uh, we have a mapping of that and the tool that we're going to see later on how to use that allows you to quickly assign uh, attack patterns to the various indicators. Yeah, and the nice aspect is basically even if attack is really a specific model, behind the scene is just a galaxy. So yeah. we carry it like a normal galaxy. You can even really have multiple models. So we are not bound to a one model. So if you are really, really like the diamond model, for example, you can still mix diamond models and might attack uh, within the same event. Uh, and then another thing, and this is the, the, the last object that, that is interesting here, is the MISP object uh, format. So this is the templating system that we have. What we found very often was that, uh, that the, the more complex the information that was that we were getting into MISP via sandbox, via detection tools, and so on, uh, the more of a difficulty we had to separate the data out into its own clusters within an event. That means that, for example, if, if, you ha if you're describing the execution of malware, and it included several dropped files that you're also describing, you had this kind of jumbled mess with, with a list of, uh, flat list of attributes in your event, and you didn't know, really know what this hash belonged to, what did this additional information belong to. So instead what we came up with was this container system where you can say this is a file object, a file object can have optionally a file name, uh, one of several different types of hashes, uh, file size, and so on. And, and then you create this object. Now the thing that, that we were struggling with at first was how, how do we come up with a, uh, with a standard list of objects that make sense for the community? Uh, we already had disagreements at the very earliest stage when we came up with the system. So in the first whiteboard brainstorming, we already had difference on how we would want to describe certain types of things. So what we ended up deciding was to go for something more relaxed. Uh, basically, these um, uh, interconnected um, uh, attributes that we have uh, in the object system uh, are pretty loosely defined. And in the end, when you're feeding your tools, all you're really interested in is these two things belong together, and these two things are a file hash of this type, and for example, a file size. You're not really interested in, in the way you, uh, you add additional context to it, for example, what kind of additional uh, fields you want to have in there. So we left it up to the communities to start defining objects. We, of course, have a standard list of objects that we, that we think makes sense, but if you want to create your own, it's as easy as creating a simple JSON file. We have the templates for it and so on that you just have to use. Uh, your only constraint is basically uh, that you have to use the basic building blocks that we have by attributes. Again, if you're missing something there, let us know and we are very quick with, uh, with adding new attribute types. So that's, we, we don't really have any roadblocks in our way. If we see something makes sense, we can do it overnight for you. So just let us know. Okay. So that's basically it uh, for the data model. Any questions to this part before we move on? Because uh, if, if a, a, any of the objects so, or the fields wasn't clear. Yes? So let's talk about uh, creating new objects mm -hmm. and referring to the consumer not having the right constraints. So right. So uh, that's, that's a very good question. Something that comes up very often is, indeed, you run the risk of a, a consumer having a tool that reads a very specific type of object and feeds it to a, uh, into a different tool. So if I, have, if I expect a file object that has certain fields that I'm expecting and I want to convert it to something else, if I get a file object in a custom object where it is slightly differently described, I'm going to struggle with it if I have an automated tool. On the other hand, something that we've seen very often is people will, for example, look for any object that has uh, a, a, a file hash in it that is marked for automation as something malicious and say, okay, I'm interested in this together with these other uh, pieces in there. I'm, I don't care about the template. As long as these certain pieces of data are contained, I can convert it. So it's a different strategy on how you're converting it. With one strategy, uh, where you're literally translating an existing template with known uh, list of fields, you're indeed going to run into troubles with custom objects. On the other hand, sometimes you want to do it. It also depends a little bit on your community. 
uh, and what kind of data you want to convert. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's mentioning the template things, if you have two mm -hmm. different versions of the template. Um, so that's another thing. Yeah, um, that's why yeah. So sometimes you might have data that you receive, but we don't have the template. So with MISP, you can still read it, mm -hmm. but the only thing that you cannot do is to edit it. So if you don't have any template for a specific object, it's still fine. MISP mm -hmm. will be able to read it. So you will see it, you can even consume it, use it. But the only drawbacks, if you don't have the template, you cannot edit it. Yeah. Which is basically the only uh, aspect. In the end, think, think of the templates uh, this way. It does have some metadata and some context, but in the end, it's, it's really ended together attributes of something that you're de defining. So basically, you're saying that this thing has this hash, it has this size, it was seen at this time, and so on. So depending on, on what you're ingesting, you might not really care about the template itself as long as your data points exist within. Okay. So any other questions before we have a look at MISP itself? No? Okay. So this is, uh, when you log into MISP, this is the first thing you're going to see. Whoops. I just want to see whether I'm logged out yet. No, it's fine. Uh, so when you log in, you're going to see a list of events. So the, the, the index that, that you get when you log in uh, contains one event per line. What you can see here is usually the metadata that is most interesting for users at first glance to have an idea what we're actually dealing with here. So generally, we have the producer of the data. That's the first column. The second one is only available to administrators, and it's not that interesting. Then we have a local ID for the, for the event, and this is something that will come up very often with MISP. Most objects in MISP have two IDs. One is a local ID, which is a numeric incrementing uh, ID, and the other is a UUID. UUIDs remain the same across instances. So if you know the UUID of an event, you can go to a different instance, enter the UUID, and check if they have the event as well. So that is completely unique. However, the local IDs are unique to your instance only. So this is something that you have to be a bit, little bit careful, uh, uh, careful of whenever you write in your own scripts. If you, for example, want to just uh, aggregate data from five different MISPs, it's better to deal with UUIDs than with IDs. On the other hand, it is much easier uh, when you're interacting with humans to talk about uh, a simple numeric ID, and, and uh, it, I have a much easier time telling Alexandre, for example, to look at event 11,500 uh, than reading out this UUID and uh, waiting for him to actually find the correct one. So this is just something uh, to keep in mind, that you have these two things. All of the actions uh, that you can undertake with an event or with an attribute or an object can be done either via the ID or the UUID. So if you're looking at the documentation of the API, and you see that there is an event ID field that expects either the local ID or the UID, and both will work. Okay. Uh, apart from that, we have a list of tags and clusters here. So here we have an example of uh, an attack pattern. So this is coming from the enterprise attack pattern uh, library uh, that is attached to this event. So what, what this says is that this event is this, uh, uh, contains a pattern ex exploitation for privilege escalation and PowerShell, ex ex uh, PowerShell ex uh, exploitation. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, this is a way to contextualize the data already. So if you're looking for certain types of data, you can use the cluster and tag information to filter on that already. So for example, if I would be interested in everything related to scam, I just click on scam, and it's going to use that ta uh, tag as a filter uh, and show me all the events that are related to it. Okay. And then we, uh, we have some additional metadata. How many attributes does it contain? How many correlations do we have on these? These are all optional, by the way. So by default, on MISP, you don't have those enabled, I think. Uh, but you can enable those additionally. Uh, uh, the email address is only shown to site administrators. So we have, we're in a bit of a privileged position here, being logged in as a site admin. Normally, that is not visible to users. So we never disclose uh, email addresses normally to um, uh, users. Uh, and then you have the info field, which is probably the uh, most important part of the uh, of the index. When you look at it, you want to see, okay, I'm interested in a certain um, topic. Uh, let's have a look at the events that, uh, that are talking about that topic. Okay, so let's have a look at an actual event here. For example, which, which one should we pick? Wow. Well, the first one. First one? Okay. First one. So we have a sextortion. Um, event here. It has a bunch of tags already classifying the information. So it says it is TLP green. So uh, it, we also have um, our own uh, classification schema where we basically say the, uh, the cl classification of this incident is a spam uh, and so on. 
So this already gives us an idea of what we're dealing with without actually having seen the actual indicators within the event. Uh, Apart from that, we, we, we can already see what kind of sightings uh, are attached to the event, when it was last modified, and so on. So a bunch of metadata. The other interesting thing here is that we already see that we have a correlation in here. That means that some data in this event was already seen in a different event before. So if we hover over that, we get some more information about it, and we see that it's another sextortion uh, event. That means that if you're getting indicators and then you're just pasting it into an event, Based on the correlation, you immediately get context out of it. And you say, oh, this was already seen in this extortion um, uh, event. Let's have a look at that and see what uh, the commonalities are. Is it really something that tells me that this current event has to do with the same topic as the other one? And if yes, then you already have a good starting point in your analysis. Okay. And then if we scroll down, uh, we see the actual indicators below. So here we have a, a bunch of uh, Bitcoin addresses. Uh, that, are, uh, that have some metadata around it, so we can see that these Bitcoin addresses uh, were seen as part of financial fraud, so Bitcoin addresses we only have in that category. We can have comments in there, and what we see immediately is, again, correlations. So we see that this Bitcoin address was already used in this extortion case, so that already gives us some idea about it. Uh, what Alexander has already talked about with the sightings uh, uh, before is right now we don't have any sightings on this event, but you could mark each event with a thumbs up and thumbs down. You want to do it? Yeah, okay. which one is fine. Okay. So we now added a sighting to this one. We already get a little graph there, which would look different if we would have more sightings. So historically, of course. Uh, but basically with this, we've just said, we've seen, the, uh, we've seen this somewhere already. Uh, so... Uh, of course, this is really tedious to do by hand, so the idea is this is also API exposed. If you have, for example, for IP addresses a scene, that will automatically just trigger everything that, uh, that, that you see in there. That's also an option. Okay. Uh, maybe no ob objects in here. Let's find a different one. Is it possible through the mm -hmm. API to identify that you have already checked it? Uh, uh, Yes, I don't know if it's well defined, but indeed you can search for uh, for uh, for the ID of an attribute and see see the existing sightings, and and then each of the sightings have an organization attached to it, and if it's yours, then yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but sometimes you might want to uh, to cite it more than once, so uh, it's not necessarily something that you only want to cite once because each sighting has a, a timestamp attached to it. So if something is still active, you might want to have build a historic view out of it. Yeah, for, for example, for the sex option case, if we receive like four tickets with the same Bitcoin address, we can just say, okay, we, we see it four times, seeing that maybe one of the Bitcoin address has been more used on the others. Yeah, and the interesting uh, tool that we have with this is, uh, is the mail to miss tool does that exactly with spam. So what happens is each time an indicator that already exists comes in a new spam email, it marks all the existing ones already with a sighting, so that we can see, for example, okay, this has been seen 2,000 times already, and then we can even draw a timeline between which times it has been seen. Maybe we get uh, s sometimes, for example, uh, already parked uh, domains being reused again after a longer break, so you, you get some interesting uh, time-based correlations out of that as well. Okay, so let's go back here. Uh, let's find a different one, actually. Oops, that has objects in it. You want to create an object? Well, we can do. We yeah. can just we can just go straight for creating one. So let's have a look at how to actually create an event and uh, then go from there. So every time you create an event via the UI, that is, it starts with creating the uh, container itself uh, as a first step. Uh, as you can see, the form for creating an event is very simple. So if you want to f to follow this part, by all means, if you have the VM already installed, just play with and try the same thing as well. Uh, what you can see here with the, uh, with the metadata that you can fill out is you basically uh, you just have to define a proposed date. So this is something very lax on purpose. We want to just uh, have this based on the context that you're sharing. So if you're, for example, describing uh, a, a, a sandbox execution, then the date would basically mean the execution of the sandbox. However, in some cases, the date might mean something different depending on what you're describing. So as an example, you receive a report from an antivirus vendor. Yeah. And you know that um, they basically did uh, the report based on the incident that they analyzed like two months ago. Then you set the dates two months ago to be sure that you have basically the timeline of, of the event. Yeah, This is uh, something very loose and basically it's just supposed to deal as a first guideline of if you're dealing with something very old or something recent. It's, it's not the most accurate measure either. 
then you describe the distribution. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the near future, but basically something to keep in mind is MISF has two different systems for distributions. So this is the field that defines who gets to see the data and who gets to receive the data. One of them is basically based on distance, saying only I can see it, everyone on my current instance can see it, everyone on all directly connected instances can see it, and so on and so forth. So that's the distance-based one. And then the other one is basically a distribution list. That's something we call sharing groups. These are reusable groups uh, that include a list of organizations that are involved in the sharing, along with a list of communities that are involved in the sharing. So you can use either of those methods depending on what you prefer. Uh, so in some cases, you might want to be very restrictive and say, I only want to exchange with three other partners that are out there because they were involved in an incident and I don't want anyone else to know about it. You can absolutely do that using sharing groups. Or you might want to say, everyone in, for example, this community should, should be able to see this event. Then you can do, use the distance-based distribution uh, method. Then we have two fields that are a little bit subjective, of course. One is the threat level. Uh, this is a highly debated field because uh, what may appear as low to someone might be a very high threat level to someone else. So it is... Yeah, and technically this kind of, of information usually now should be conveyed through Galaxy, through yeah. tags and so on. So it's, it's, it's there for historical reason, uh, yeah. but it has not that much meaning, I would say. Yeah, if you, if you leave it all on undefined and just describe it via tags and galaxies, I think everyone's better off anyway. Yeah. Uh, the analysis level, this is more of a courtesy feel thing that I'm still working on it. Um, uh, don't consider it as final information. It's just, I'm just at the initial part of my analysis. I will add more information, but it's also one of those things that is not that important. Now, this field after it is the most important part, event info. This is where you're describing what you're dealing with here. And uh, and again, this is very... Uh, this, this might seem like something very straightforward, but it is where we have the most issues when people are sorting out with the sharing. Again, anything that is internal references and so on, not a good idea to put in there if you're going to share the event. Uh, another thing is be concise. So what, uh, the reason why we've made that field so small, it used to be much bigger than that, and it was a text field where you could paste entire uh, essays in there, literally, was we had the issue of people putting technical indicators in there. Keep in mind, if you put any technical indicator in a text field, it will not be parsed, it will not be sent to tools. Uh, people can still read it, but they won't be able to use it directly. So make sure that this is really just describing what, what the intent of the thing. The other thing is, you might be interacting with different types of communities where you have a different understanding of what you're doing. Please make sure to be as universally understandable as possible here. So if you have uh, a secret squirrel club lingo that you use, if you're going to share it out with the white community, it might not be a good idea to use that. So just something to keep in mind. The extended events we're going to see a little bit later on. If you want this event to be attached to another event and say this one extends the information contained with another, this is where you would put the local ID or the global UUID of that event in there. So let's just create a small test event that is only visible to our organization so we don't spam the actual live instance. Uh, and create our event. So now we have a, a, a bare-bone event created. This one has some metadata pre-filled based on what we've just done, and it has absolutely no attributes or objects or anything contained within. Uh, this is your starting point. This will already warn you, this event has no attributes. P please don't publish it because you're just sending an empty envelope out there. Uh, to populate the event, you have a lot of different tools. So, as Alexandre has mentioned, we're trying to cater to very different types of use cases and very different uh, types of users. Uh, one of the things that you will very often do is indeed get a report in and just try to encode it as quickly as possible in MISP. So, this is wh uh, where you have the uh, free text import tool. So, if you go to populate from and then click free text import tool, you get this little text field where you can paste whatever text blob you have in there and MISP will try to figure it out what it's dealing with. So, for example, I have you have any uh, text that you, that uh, that you you uh, you paste in there you click submit uh misp will uh, try to par uh, to parse it it will say oh i found the domain in there uh, google.com i found an ip address in there 8.8.8.8 uh, these could be indicators and then it says okay I've seen this in many different places. It's kind of scary how many times we have 8.8.8 in there, but it's probably coming from 
uh, test events like this one during the training. Yeah. Some not sadly, but that's a different question. <laughs> so you guys do the one in this too. Guys can do one in this after. Yeah, we will, we can do it after. We're this way. I did this yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, what Miss cannot do for you in this case is resolve which one of several possible options uh, was meant in here. It can give you a best estimate. For example, an IP address can be an IP destination or an IP source. What Miss will do is uh, most of IP destinations are shared, so it's probably that but not necessarily sure, sure about that. So it will give you a list of all the valid options based on the parsing uh, rules in there. And then you select what is most appropriate at this stage. Uh, you can also say that, okay, uh, google.com, oh, I, I know that, that is definitely not something I want to have in there. So you just click it away and then it will, won't save that. Uh, once you're satisfied with the changes that you've made, so you've said, okay, this one should go to the IDS because I think this is a, uh, very uh, highly malicious IP address out there, uh, and uh, you set the distribution rules, maybe you've added some comments. Once you're done, you can just go to the bottom and click Submit Attributes, and MISP will then take that as an input and create an event out of it. Hmm. It's going a bit slowly. It's going on there. So MISP has now added our, our, our highly malicious attribute here, uh, and it's already warning us that something is wrong here. Uh, so what it's doing is uh, it's checking against the warning list and saying, whoa, this, this is already containing two uh, warning lists out there. So public DNS resolvers and that we have a separate IPv4 public DNS resolver list. So it warns us that this is a uh, potential false positive. Also at the top of the event, you'll get a little box saying, warning, there's a potential false positive in there. Now, this has two use uses. One, it's supposed to notify analysts saying, this is something that you probably shouldn't push to your tools because it's an obviously a false positive out there. Uh, and then the other th uh, thing is that the analyst that's creating the event might ignore it and share it anyway. The other use of the warning list is you can use this as a parameter in all of the APIs and say, exclude everything from the exports that trips over one of these lists. That means that even if I share this information out there, mo most people that are using the APIs correctly and feeding their tools correctly will not be affected at all because they already used the, the enforced warning list flag and it will be filtered out of any export uh, when they're feeding an IDS, for example. Okay. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to edit it. So every list that we have in MISP has some action buttons on the right. Uh, that's where you edit things. So that's what I'm doing right here. And I can say, okay, I've seen this information, but it should not be sent to any of the exports automatically. Uh, I unflagged it, I click Submit, and then the attribute is edited. I don't know what's going on with... It's being so slow now, but okay. Uh, another thing to, uh, th that is interesting at, uh, at this point is uh, uh, that immediately when you enter something, you see the correlations out there. So as Alexander has mentioned, something that might happen is, besides the fact that um, in, the, in this case we found an obvious false positive, you might already have a lot of information about something out there, which leads you to different decision uh, branches, basically, in your workflow. Either you say, okay, this is something that everyone knows about already, let's just discard this anyway and stop working on this. It's already something known. Or maybe you just use it as a basis of getting additional context on the data that you've already uh, got in your hands right now. So that's up to you. Once you've entered the data and you've decided to keep it, you can start adding context to it. Again, context comes from two different sources, either taxonomies and tags, or via galaxies. So tags are very simplistic. You just click on the, this little plus icon in the tag field, uh, and then you get a list of the various taxonomies that you can choose from. Uh, so again, we have a lot of taxonomies enabled in our instance, but depending on how your administrator runs your instance, you might only have one or two options. If you, if you want to, uh, pigeonhole your users into using some uh, taxonomies, it has a lot of advantages, then you won't uh, see a list like this. Uh, but let's say that we want to use the PAP pro uh, taxonomy, which basically mm -hmm. is something like TLP, but describing what you can do with the information. Uh, so if you hover over it, you're going to get a, a, an explanation of that. Uh, Ember says, for example, passive cross checks are allowed. So if I, I want to say, okay, this is what I want to tag it with, just click it and it will attach a tag to the, uh, to the attribute. Okay, there we go. And it's the same idea with galaxies. So uh, galaxies are just a different uh, library. If you want to at uh, attach uh, an attack pattern, uh, you can click on the attack uh, library 
here let's choose a pattern and you get the uh, attack browser if you if you're familiar with the, with the attack navigator we've tr tried to model it uh, very similarly to that so the idea is that if you're familiar with one you're kind of familiar with the other uh, and th then you just select the um, template that you want to add and you click submit and then it will be added to the attribute okay so it's as simple as that mm -hmm. uh, Again, this is just an example for attack. You can also use MIS galaxies that will use a different uh, UI for selecting the, uh, the galaxy that you're after. Uh, mix and match uh, uh, the different libraries to be able to define everything that you want to, uh, to describe to, uh, to your community. And the galaxy are available at the event level, so you can add it at the event yep. level too. And this is something that comes up very often. Yeah. Sometimes you will have an event with 10,000 attributes in there. So you have a massive list of IP addresses that you've collected from a tool, uh, and you want to share that out. Now, something that we've seen is when people want to tag all of them, for example, TLP uh, green, they will go through each individual event uh, attribute of the script and create 10,000 tags. Please don't do that. By default, uh, everything that is tagged in event level is assumed to be inherited by all the attributes contained within. So if you mark an event TLP green, everything within is also uh, thought of as TLP green and the filters will work that way. So uh, when you have the decision of either tagging on the attribute or event level, always consider is this the exception within the event or is this uh, uh, something that defines all the attributes in there or most of the attributes. If it's the latter, do it on the event level instead. Okay? Right. So. Now we've seen how to add uh, attributes with, uh, the simple way via the free tax import. Of course, the downside of this is uh, that it's not some massive AI sitting behind it figuring out what all those indicators are. It's a very simple algorithm actually that uh, runs a bunch of regex checks against it. So there is no black magic behind it and sometimes it will miss stuff. So if you want to have more control over what, uh, over what you're inputting, you can impo uh, uh, input attributes manually. Just click the little plus button here and you're going to get this interface up here where you select the category, you select the type, and so on. So you have the most control over this interface. Of course, it's also more tedious. It takes more time. Uh, if you have um, uh, different IP addresses, domains, and so on to add, you have to go through the same form several times, paste all the values into the field, add it, and so on. So it's a, a question of having more control versus uh, being faster. Depending on the use case, you might use one or the other. Uh, it is very simple to use. You have a list of categories. If I want to describe another IP address, uh, I just select the, the appropriate type and the category. Keep in mind, some types only exist in some categories, so so not not every every type is available in every category. Of course, you cannot describe uh, Bitcoin for payload installation, for example. Makes sense. Uh, so we just adhere to the rules uh, given by the system. Uh, again, you can set the distribution level and then you can enter a value. Now, something that comes up here very often and we see some frustration with the system is people adding IP addresses one by one and having to go through this whole thing over and over. There is a batch import button and then you can paste the massive list of IP addresses here, for example, all lines separated and it will count each line as a separate value. Okay. Uh, again, IDS flag, you can set, uh, uh, set it or not depending on uh, what you want with the... Um, attribute to happen. And maybe a small note to take yeah. here is, uh, is that thing on the bottom there, which is a GDPR notice. So this is an optional feature that you can enable. And then GDPR is just the first system, uh, first library we have for the notification system. You can write your own. So if you want to, for example, write a, no uh, a notice list for, uh, that, that warns users if they're inputting any um, uh, uh, financial indicators in there to be careful before inputting that, just check with your manager if you really are allowed to share that information. If you want to write anything like that, it's again a JSON file that you just populate and the MIS will just read and use it from that yeah. point. And, and the file is based on rules, depending on the type, attribute, yeah. and so on. So for example, if you change the rules to uh, attribution, for example, you'll see that basically those might contain personal information. Um, yeah. And then you have different uh, notice depending on the type of attribute uh, that you have. Yep. And like Andras mentioned, it's basically a JSON file with rules and you can create your own and you can enable some parts. So if you are not bound to the GDPR, but you can just remove it, uh, but you can add the additional one. Yep. And once you're done, again, you can just add your attribute and it will create a new attribute for you. Again, warning us that this one is uh, hitting on a warning list for the same reason as the previous one. You can make a proposal for this one. Hmm? You can make a proposal for this one. 
Indeed, that's a good idea. So what happens if, if you see uh, something that you disagree with uh, in an event that is coming from someone else? We're again in the fortunate situation that we're logged in as a site admin, so we can use all the functionalities of MISP. That means that we can directly edit what we've just created, but we can also use it from the other perspective and, and propose some, a change to it. So we're going to just do that, and instead of using the edit button here on the right, we're going to use the propose edit button. If you click that, you get the exact same interface as an attribute edit, but it's an app proposal one. So we're going to say, okay, just remove the IDS flag from this one and propose the change. Okay, and what happened now is we created a proposal. So that's that orange marked thing. The bracket shows us what it is proposing to modify. If there's a proposal that is just a new attribute to be proposed, then you won't have the bracket around another attribute around it. What this tells us is it's exactly the same attribute as what we have in the original, but the IDS flag is set to no. And then you have uh, the option as, the, uh, as a user of the creating organization of this event to either, uh, either say, I disagree with this or I agree with this and, uh, and accept it. If, it is, uh, if you disagree with it and you click the discard button, uh, it will delete the proposal uh, and it is uh, basically left as a soft deleted uh, element in the database. However, if you accept it, what will happen is the, the proposal gets deleted and the uh, actual attribute gets modified. So in this case, we've removed the ideas flag from the original. Okay? So do you get a list of proposals for your Sorry? Do you get a list of proposals for your Yes. Uh, so as a site admin, it's kind of messed up. So that's, that will look a little yeah, bit it, it wonky, will, yeah. but yes. Uh, if you click, click on this little uh, mail button on top, uh, then you have uh, the different notifications here, and one is the, the proposals that you can see. Now, uh, this is a little bit tricky because we see all the proposals since we're site admin, so we get a massive list. They're not necessarily all proposals for us. But if you're logged in as a normal user, you will only see the proposals that affect you. No, no, it's, it's per organization. Per organization. Yes, yes. And, and actually... Um, each, so it's yeah. something important for each event is basically bound to the organizations. Yeah. Um, so that means the whole organization will see it. So uh, it's, it's not bound to the user. The, we don't carry information about the single user that basically created the event. So it's always the organizations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, indeed. That's a good point. Uh, but for proposals, they're also visible to everyone. So it's not going to be in, in this list specifically, but if you look at an event, you will see the proposals of others, even uh, as long as you have as access. As long as you have access to the attribute. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. So uh, the original is proposed by, by organization, but then, for example, if you open the event, you are, I think, okay. well, what, 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 what do I get because of the API? Okay, then it is ignored. So by default, it's ignored. So that means the proposal itself will not appear. Except in one case, yeah, uh, the one that he mentioned uh, previously, we have uh, parameters in MISP saying that we automatically uh, remove the IDS flag if there's a proposal to remove it. Uh, so it's just, it's just a parameter in, in But MISP. indeed, the, the downside with proposals is indeed if you're exporting to your IDS, even if you've created a proposal and you've added something, you've modified something, it will not go to your IDS. So if you want it to go to your IDS and, uh, uh, and you want to attach additional information to someone else's event, use the extended event functionality. Because that one, uh, those are actual attributes that are used for the automation. So it's, it's basically, th that's a decision that you have to make whenever you, you have additional information or want to correct something. Do I want to create this actual data right away under my name? Or do I just want to create as a proposal under, for example, Exxon's name or the, his organization's name? But in that case, I have to wait for him to accept it. So it's... Yeah, proposal is, I would say, kind of edge case usually for changing. Yeah. Um, so usually you use extended event, but if you really want to basically tell the others that there's something wrong, yeah. that's usually the proposal. Yeah. Well. That's a huge advantage of it is uh, that you're, it's, uh, it's also kind of communication with whoever created the event, because we, if you create an extended event, they will probably get it as well, but not notice it. But if you create a proposal, they will see it as a message. They will get an email about it saying, hey, there's a proposal to something that you have created probably should look at that. So it's it, it might, might make sense to create both, actually, to just create a proposal so that you do, to notify the other party, but also to create an extend event to have it in your IDSs directly. So yeah. OK. So let's go back to our little event, or you mm -hmm. want to? Just for us in five minutes. OK. Uh, 
Um, so we, we now talked about two different ways to populate it. There is one edge case that we barely ever mention or didn't for a while because we thought nobody was using it. But in some organizations, uh, you have a lot of, uh, of people that are working in help desk, for example. They're going to get emails in that they might want to share with, the, with their security team. Uh, and they will not necessarily have the necessary know-how on, on what kind of information should be shared, how it should be shared, what the different types and categories are, what the IDS flag is. So they don't have the uh, have the uh, um, the means of sharing the correct information. It can be frustrating. So we have a, a small system that you can use for this use case, which we call the templating system. Uh, so these templates are generally um, created by an administrator. So they say that we expect users at our help desk to fill out this form uh, where we describe each field, what they should put in there. And then they can, based on the use case that they're describing, just go through a simplified form. An example uh, that we can use here is a phishing email. They get a phishing email in, they can use a phishing email form to just fill out the various fields. So here it says, for example, from address, the source address from which the email was sent. That's pretty straightforward uh, for someone to just paste in there without having to know what category this would go into, what type it would go into, whether the IDS flag is set, and so on. All of these things are baked into the template itself. So, th so you remove the decision-making process of, uh, of contextualizing the information and you hand it over to whoever creates the templates. So this is just something that you can use. Initially, we were just using it as kind of an internal gag because we thought it was a completely failed feature. And we just uh, mentioned it briefly at trainings. And then we went to an organization where they were religiously using this feature. We were like, okay, so it has its, its purpose apparently. Uh, so I, I, I guess it also depends on the size of the organization, the, the, the number of uh, people that ro get rotated in and out. So it has a lot of different aspects to it. If you want to go through that, just fill out this form uh, and then you're going to get all the attributes created. Uh, the good thing with this is that you can, first of all, write clear text to the users and describe what, you're ex what uh, is expected of them, how to find that information. You can put that information into each of the different fields in there, uh, and what is mandatory and what is optional. So all of this is up to you when you're creating the template. Okay. Is there a, mm -hmm. potentially a validation process behind this? So that you, when you have somebody who says, okay, yeah. yes, <laughs> yeah, very good that you asked because I completely forgot to mention it. Yes, indeed. So generally, whenever you create data in MISP, it is not used by uh, by any tools. It is not shared. It is kept local. And that is this published flag here. So uh, the idea is that whenever you're inputting data, you're generating all of the data that you want to share out and that you want to feed your, to uh, your tools with, but it is not acted upon until someone publishes it. Now, if you want to have internal processes where you want to have a senior uh, member of your team review the data first, you, uh, you can decide to hand out different roles to different users. So MISP has a very extensive role-based access control system where you can say, this user is just a regular user that can create a, a, and, and view data, and this user can additionally publish data. So you can separate those two aspects. And then you have your junior analysts that can just create the data, and the senior analyst does the actual publishing after vetting the data. So you can absolutely do it this way. So for example, people uh, in the help desk could just create a lot of events using those templates, and then someone reviews them and decides, okay, this is ready for publication, it can go out. So what is the difference between a published and unpublished event? All users of an instance can see unpublished events. They can see it, so, so they can read the data. Uh, it will not be synchronized out to a different instance. So if you have an internal MISP instance, anything that is unpublished will stay invisible to everyone on the outside. Uh, except uh, that, it is not going to any of the tools. And something that we will talk a little bit later on, it is not going to the zero MQ pub sub channel. So this is uh, something that might also be interesting. If you have other tools that are hooked into MISP via pub sub channel, uh, they will not receive the data until it is published. Okay. We talk about delegations, maybe I, ah, can, yeah, which I, we can, can, do I, can, I can do it. So okay, can sure. Because I can do these questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so the thing is, when we talk about publishing, uh, we talk about the delegations. Uh, you see that Andras select organization only. So that's meaning that the distributions will be limited uh, to your own organizations. In the case that you don't want to share the information to, um, to everyone, you basically create your own, uh, own event with uh, the limitation to your organizations. But maybe you want to share it to a third-party organization. So what you can do, um, you see that 
you have on the left side the delegate publishing. So this one only appears on information that was never published as a different distribution than your organization only. And this one is a way to delegate the publication to a third party. And then you can select an organization. I'm, I'm taking this one, for example. Um, and then this one will receive the event and will receive a notification. So we can even say, okay, to the target organizations uh, that we want a specific distribution to all communities, we can uh, uh, send a specific message to tell exp 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 to make an explanation of why we want to uh, uh, delegate it. And then you see that the delegation request is outgoing. So Circle has requested that Igloska.ou take over this event. And Igloska, what you will receive, you will receive a request of delegation that an organization is requesting that uh, it be uh, distributed to everyone. And then you can do an accept or a discount. Accept means that basically all the initial event is completely removed and a complete new event is created on the name of the new organization, target organizations. So it's a way to basically pseudonymize a sharing of information uh, to that one. But this one will only appear if you have only your own, own organizations as distributions because it's a bit silly to distribute information that was public at one point and then sending back as uh, something that is basically under a different name. I will just discard it. So like that, it's not accepted. Yes, I want to discard it. Okay. Then, as uh, Andras mentioned, this event is not published. So that means that all the users from this instance can see it, but it's still not dispatched to all the other instances. So, and this has a different impact too. So when you don't publish information, it is not exportable to IDS and stuff like that. So if you, for example, go on download as, what do you see? You can still export it in different formats, but those ones are just formats that are, you can use to transfer information and so on, but it's not used as uh, production information. Uh, you, you can, for example, get the MISP JSON format automatically. Uh, a side note to that, uh, if we go back to the event, and if you happen at the end of the event, the JSON, you'll get automatically the JSON format of the event. Uh, it's very handy because what you can do with that, you can basically take over the JSON files, go to another MISP, and import it back as is. Um, you can even directly see the format. You can see how, uh, how the format is described. Uh, the format is completely standardized. Um, but it's a, and this kind of approach works on every interface in MISP. So if you go to the statistics page of MISP, and we can do that, uh, I'm going to go on this one. So this one is basically giving the number of events. If, if I append the JSON at the end, uh, I basically get the same page as a JSON expression. So it's very handy and nifty if you have, for example, tons of tools doing uh, monitoring, stuff like that. You can just like point to a specific JSON. Usually the majority of pages in MISP are uh, automatable like this. Uh, but if you have one missing, just tell us and we can, we can extend it. So going back to our event, we, we are quite happy with it. We may, maybe need to add additional information. We can create, for example, an object. So in this case, I will take a, a simple object, a meaningful one. So I take a person object. So you see that the addition of object is exactly like attributes, except that it's basically composed of multiple attributes. You see on top that is what is required. That uh, we need at least a first name or a last name for a person. So I take a first name, I will just for John, he has the last name. That's basically it. And then I will submit. It. So MISP will basically show me that all my object looks like. I have a gender that is set by default, last name, first, first name, and I just like say submit. So what do you will see in your event is basically this object composed of multiple attributes. It's exactly the same than uh, the MISP uh, uh, view with the attributes. Um, then I will create another object. For example, I will create uh, one, a simple one. I will just take a phone. Um, so it's basically a phone. You have all details of the phone. I can just look at what is required. Uh, at least a text. I mean, I can say that this phone has been seized from John. 
And then uh, I can put a serial number just for the first. And then you can basically add as much as object that you want in MISP in your event. And you see that now that you have those two objects. So now what you can do with it is you can basically do reference and cross-reference those objects so you can create relationship. So one of the ways to do it is, uh, for example, we take one of the objects and you can say that this phone is... Uh, I'll take the other one, that's maybe easier. I'll take the persons and I would just say that they are using this phone. And for example, I can say that this phone becomes to one of the IP addresses that Andrej handed uh, from Google. So that's one way to, to do it. Then you have a, a view uh, which is the event graph view, where you can basically see that the object itself from John, we can even expand it if we want, see what is the uh, object design is basically beaconing to an IP address and we see that uh, John uh, is using this uh, kind of phone. So you see that from the interface itself, we can create the relationship. So you have these objects, you can create those from the user interface, or you can even create those uh, from um, the graph itself. So you can even look at the one that are on reference and you can even edit and add specific reference between uh, additional events, like for example, we have this uh, person uh, that's basically like, I don't know, connect to or communicate with, and then you can add this uh, additional uh, relationship. So that's the thing that's with MISP is basically the objects are just uh, a composition of attributes. So if I'm going back to the event, I have the different attribute, I have two objects. So I can say, like, for example, this event itself is like correct and I want to publish it. So if now I'm going back to publish, I have different way of publishing. I have a publish event, which is automatically what it will do. It will um, publish the event and send email notifications, uh, which is usually what you do when you have a first event with a lot of information and you want to publish it directly. I imagine that you have a brand new report with a lot of information, you do that. If you do some minor changes and so on, you can even publish it without email notifications. I will do this because it's basically minor uh, things. But at the same time, when you publish, all the information in this event will be pushed to all the connections that you have with other MISP. So that's really the starting point. When you publish information in MISP, it will be basically replicated to the other MISP and all the communication that you have. This instance is connected to internal instance that we have and some external one. And depending on the distribution level and where it's going to, it will be pushed to the different uh, MISP instances. Can you talk about the text filter? We'll do after. Okay, okay. Okay, so, we can do it later. Yeah. So then um, that's the thing that is basically published afterwards. So the thing that is quite handy, and uh, I think we have to, to talk about it too, it's basically if you create a new attribute, um, creating a new network activity with an IP destinations, I create one with, again, not a very clever one, but I put IDS flag. And you see automatically when you edit an event, the unpublished flag is, so the published flag is basically set to unpublished, meaning that the information needs to be republished. So everything that needs, that is changing the uh, um, event will set the unpublished flag. Same with taggings, for example. You might have, for example, adding tags, and then you have the unpublished uh, value um, set. So if I'm publishing it again, it will do again the same stuff. So that means it will synchronize with other uh, MISP instances. It will push information. It will get updated and so on. So on. If I have other MISP instance pulling data for me, those ones are new events and it will be gathered. Um, in addition to that, and that's something that you have to keep in mind, when you delete information, so you don't really delete the information itself. So um, you have what we call soft delete. And uh, we can do it with with one here. I just take this one. Yes, no, whoops. Whoops. Yeah, yeah. Whoops. So, and this one is very important. 
because some people might do mistakes sometimes. It could happen that you basically create an attribute containing very sensitive information. And you did a huge mistake. You publish it, and it's distributed on, on, on all the missing instances. So you want to delete it. When you do a deletion, by default, the deletion is just setting a flag that this attribute is deleted. So meaning that if we go in the uh, quick filter tab, we see that included deleted attribute, we still see this attribute. Meaning it will be synchronized and it will be soft deleted. So we have an option in uh, MISP that you can enable where you basically mangle the value itself. So the delete things is still deleted, but the value will be removed from uh, the value. Why we do that? It's to basically keep a state when we synchronize that specific attributes are deleted. If you don't do that, uh, you basically you don't have the state of being deleted. If, on the other hand, we uh, permanently delete the attribute, that means this attribute will be deleted. On the other hand, if you have a soft delete, you can even restore an attribute. So it's basically unsetting the delete flag, and you get back your uh, attributes. So don't forget, when you delete something, the first step with MISP and the synchronization and so on is basically we just soft delete and tell the user that this attribute is uh, deleted. There's a protective measure that you can enable uh, yeah. server-wide, which basically says that if an event has never been published, it will hard delete by default, so that you can catch something before it went out and uh, block any mistakes. Something to keep in mind also here is, I don't know if you mentioned that, uh, that there are two ways of soft deletion and depends on your server. Uh, soft deletions by default just send out a flag uh, that it has been deleted. However, there is also one that also mangles the data. Yeah. Are you, you mentioned it? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no worries. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, something that is quite important because when you have an event, you might have a lot of attributes. Uh, I was just playing with a um, quick filter tab where we basically select included the uh, deleted event. But on the other hand, you can even basically just look at it for the things that are like, for example, correlations, uh, proposals. And network. So if you have a lot of events, we can select a subcategories. So for example, I just I don't care about all the objects that I have. I just want to see my uh, network indicators, and I don't want to see any more the indeed. It's a bug. Mm -hmm. You can't unset it. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you get a bit Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, first bug found. Usually it's faster. But um, <laughs> okay, so and that's that's very uh, handy. For example, like proposal, if you have outgoing proposal, and if you have like, I don't know, 2,000 attributes, you just want to see the proposal, you just do a, a quick uh, quick filter. Uh, something else that is, I think, quite quite useful, when you start to have a lot of correlations, and you start to navigate through all the different uh, attributes and correlations and different events, you might get lost. You know the story when you go on Wikipedia, you start on one page, and you end up on Marilyn Monroe page. Uh, it's basically the same kind of thing with MISP. Um, but you can, you, what you can do in, uh, in, uh, in, in MISP is if you see a, here a kind of navigation span. So if I'm navigating back to that event, I still have the complete distributions where I was going to. So, uh, and that's usually when you do a lot of analysis and so on, you can still keep track of where you have been, uh, what kind of information you have seen and so on. And then you can even remove it afterwards. Uh, if you say, okay, this one is a dead end, and I don't want to go anymore to that one, but you can keep track. So if you do reporting afterwards, you can basically just show the thread uh, report where you have been. And I think we have to, yeah. Okay. So we continue after lunch breaks. Uh, when, how long should we take? So we start at 1.30. Good enough, okay. Yeah. Okay, so 1.30 yeah. we continue then. So we, we, lunch is served just outside on, on the side there, so. See you all in okay. a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>